Hi, everybody. So yeah, I'm Jake Bloomgart with uh, Plan Philly. We are a project of our local public radio station in Philly, um, but we did not start out that way. Um, I do have to say, I don't know how totally applicable our experience is going to be for a lot of folks. Um, we have a pretty unique story. Uh, but here goes. Um, so we were created in 2006. Um, Philly, if you don't know, is, so this is like the downtown area here, and we're in both of the city is between the two rivers here. And, well, you know, a lot of, uh, historically, a lot of factories and whatnot were concentrated along there. And you kind of had this, you know, experience over the second half of the 20th century where they all went out of business and got replaced with, like, surface parking lots and just blight and whatnot. Um, so in 2006, whoops, the city wanted to, yeah, this is kind of what the big one looked like, right? You know, they're downtown right there, and you can see kind of all the surface parking lots and crap like that. Um, so in 2006, the city wanted to kind of plan out what they were going to do with the waterfront, which, you know, could potentially be a huge untapped resource. Um, and they started this visioning project, talking with, like, community groups, all that kind of stuff. And Penn Praxis, which is a um, wing of the University of Pennsylvania School of Design, kind of realized there was no coverage. Um, you know, the newspapers had started to shrink. No one was going to the meetings. I mean, there were people going to the meetings, but there weren't reporters going to the meetings. So people didn't know what was going on. So basically, they hired a bunch of ex-inquirer reporters to start going to the meetings. They would uh, show up with a camera and film the whole thing, and also then write a story about it. Now, this actually ended up causing some problems because, you know, while they were doing the reporting on the waterfront project, you know, the guy in charge is this man, um, uh, another inquirer, old inquirer editor. Uh, he kind of realized no one's covering the planning commission. No one's uh, there's no one covering Parks and Rec on the regular. There's all these municipal bodies that were getting no coverage. Um, so we started showing up to all of those meetings. Um, and we ended up kind of getting in some, there were some problems, because in some of these places, there hadn't been reporters who would go to those meetings in so long that they were like, what are you doing here? You can't bring a camera in here. Um, we actually had to go to the law department um, to get a clear ruling that yes, these were open to the public, and the reporters could go there and record everything they were saying and doing. Um, that went for the zoning board, too. Um, and, uh, you know, famously, or, I mean, not famously, because uh, our audience is not that big, but uh, <laughs> before our reporters started showing up there, I've heard, this was way before my time, um, the woman who was the head of the zoning board at the time was very rude to the applicants a lot, and uh, once our reporters started showing up with cameras and whatnot, I mean, her behavior changed. Um, so, in any case, um, oh, yes. So, the other thing, this is kind of what the plan for the waterfront ended up being. Um, not entirely, uh, hasn't entirely worked out that way so far, but, um, so, this also coincided with, we had a new mayor elected in, uh, 2007, kind of a reform mayor. This also coincided with the city had been losing population for, you know, since the 50s. And a lot of our kind of planning and zoning regulations dated back to that time when we were a city of 2.1 million people. Um, now we're 1.5 million. Um, and so this mayor basically really wanted, you know, part of his whole platform was uh, rewriting the zoning code. Um, and, you know, that's him up there, Mayor Nutter on the left. Um, and so we were kind of perfectly, uh, you know, we were in the right place at the right time, basically, because, you know, this was a very complicated process that unfolded over pretty much his entire two terms. And, you know, the, uh, the Inquirer uh, covered the story too, but, you know, we were able to cover it in a more granular way, just because, you know, we are kind of pitched to a certain audience who tends to be very plugged into this kind of stuff. Um, um, when we've done surveys of the readership, they tend to be pretty highly educated, um, have 
pretty high incomes, especially for our city. Um, so from that, we kind of think that it's probably a lot of the professional people who are plugged in, a lot of people you know, work for the city, a lot of zoning lawyers, um, uh, a lot of academics, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, and a lot of people involved in the uh, community groups. Um, anyway, yeah, so we were in the right place at the right time. Whoops. Sorry, it's the first time we used this program. Um, now that all that's over, so we are one of the organizations with the Inquirer and the, and, and um, uh, I mean, really, just the inquiry. Oh no, the, there's a couple other kind of smaller publications as well that cover city council on the regular. Um, and again, it's uh, we don't go into the you know drama as much between all the council members. We tend to when you know a TOD bill is introduced, we like really go into the nitty gritty of what exactly this means um, for the transit stations in the city. Um, whereas in a lot of other publications, you know, you just kind of because you have are trying to appeal to the kind of broader readership, you can't really go into the details like that because they won't read that. Whereas with our folks, they tend to stay on the page for four to five minutes, which is pretty insane. Um, there's not a lot of other publications I'm aware of where that happens. And again, I think it's just because the people who tend to read our website really, really, really care. Um, We've also done a bunch of uh, series on housing. This is a neighborhood in North Philly where the housing authority knocked down some uh, public housing towers recently. It's kind of trying to redraw, you know, just rebuild the neighborhood. Um, there have been a lot of controversy because they seized a lot of people's properties. Um, and uh, it's kind of this weird throwback situation almost where it's something like housing authorities, you know, used to do back when they had money. Um, and now, actually, with this, with what's happening in Washington right now, there's a fair amount of questions of whether they're going to be able to actually wrap this up, which means they may have just knocked down a bunch of stuff and won't be able to build anything. But hopefully that won't happen. But um, anyway, so let me see, where was I? Uh, yeah, so I guess Originally, we were funded by foundations, the William Penn Foundation. Um, then there was uh, basically a period a few years ago when the William Penn Foundation decided they didn't want to fund journalism anymore. Uh, so we've cobbled together some other foundation funding to keep us going. But the big thing is that we partnered with the local uh, uh, NPR station. And they kind of just agreed to backstab us. Um, they provide us with office space, and you know we're all full-time employees there now. Um, and if we're ever short on foundation money, um, which happens periodically, they fill in the gap. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty great partnership. They're also training our reporters in radio, so now we're kind of able to bring our stories uh, to a broader audience, um, although in a more truncated fashion. Um, yeah. Uh, so here are some recent uh, housing stories we've done. These are all, all mine. This is uh, another thing. We kind of have a fair amount of freedom to, you know, if you just get a story idea, you can, yeah, you can pursue it. I got really in, uh, interested in the eviction court because uh, I read uh, Evicted last year and talked to uh, Matt Desmond a lot, and so I started going to eviction court. Um, that's another situation where they're not used to reporters being around. Um, and I talked to a lot of uh, legal aid firms. It turned out they were all gathering data on the number of lawyers who the tenants, or the percentage of tenants who had lawyers, the percentage of the landlords who had lawyers, and yes, yeah, just a gross uh, imbalance of power. They're actually having city council hearings on Monday about the right to counsel, like they just uh, passed in New York. Um, yeah, so I think that may be pretty much everything. I mean, yeah, I am relatively new to Planned Philly. I've been there for about seven months. Um, uh, yeah, before that, I covered housing as a freelancer. Um, but yeah, it's been really great to actually go. Now I'm going to, you know, the historic 
commission meetings every every month. The planning commission. I'm usually the only reporter there. Um, I can sometimes scoop the papers because I learn things before they do. Because I'm actually in the meetings where they're having the boring conversations. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty great job. What are some of the like really sexy things they talk about at the historic commission? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, I'm, not, I'm being truthful. No, I've, well, got, I've done some. I think interesting stories about about historic properties. So I just yeah. wonder. And I don't think we have actual meetings, though. Right. Well, in Philly, it's a really big deal because we have pretty strong historic protections, but we never nobody ever really used them because for half a century nobody wanted to. You know, there's there wasn't anything happening. There was no construction, basically, mm -hmm. or not very much construction. So turns out we are now a world heritage city, um, but. Uh, and now construction is taking off, but only two to three percent of the buildings in the city are protected. Wow. So you're getting lots of beautiful buildings nice. that are getting knocked down for huge condos and whatnot. Um, which, you know, I'm not uh, against huge condos going up, but there are some um, really unfortunate things that are going on. Um, and so you can sometimes catch that um, if you go, especially not just to the historic commission meetings, but like the sub groups, because um, they have to start planning that stuff out way far in advance, and um, yeah, you can catch some pretty good stuff there, too. So, that's pretty much everything. Any other questions? Or do I take questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I have sort of a more modest thing to talk about. I did not like create an uh, uh, organization from scratch. I simply uh, wrote an article. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, so I, it's, this is sort of a funny article to talk about. I think it'll be a story that is familiar to uh, many people in this room, which is, I was sort of thinking of it as like, sort of like the three stages of journalism, where I started out and I had a super ambitious idea, and it was really sort of philosophical and thoughtful. And then you'll notice that this article was published on December 27th because they came into the office and were like, does anyone here have a pulse and can they like pull together a story from the front page in the next eight hours? <laughs> um, and so it kind of came together in this flurry of chaos that I thought was terrible and hope no one would ever see it. And then sort of, you know, it got published and it was fine. And you know, I think everyone knows this story. But, um, but I'll tell you sort of how, I'll, I'll start off with the sort of philosophy and the idea behind it, which is, I think one of the challenges, so I cover the national housing market, and one of the challenges about writing about it right now is that it is, in most respects, a fairly healthy market. Um, and I think there can be sort of a temptation, given what we went through 10 years ago, to sort of look at a chart and, for example, say, like, house flipping is going from this to this, and then it goes like this. And you want to write a story being like, this is like the next housing bubble. And the thing that I kind of tell myself every day is, the next housing crisis is not going to look like the last housing crisis. And so to try to look for stories about what is this housing crisis. And I think we've touched on this throughout the day. I think this housing crisis has to do with inequality. It has to do with affordability. It has to do with the fact that rich, wealthy homeowners with expensive homes have recovered, and those with less expensive homes have not recovered and with the fact that middle-income people haven't been able to buy in to the recovery. And so that was the really great <coughs> idea I had for a story that I was going to work on for eight months and instead um, did this, which gets at the idea, but in a sort of quick and dirty way. So there were two, so the first thing I did was I went and I looked for some data and there were two sources that I went to. Um, one of them was a guy named uh, Alan Weiss, who um, some of you may know was the Weiss and Case Schiller Weiss. And there was, I don't know, some kind of nerd split or drama. And <laughs> that is no longer the case. Um, and he has this sort of really interesting theory, which I really like and which is super hard to write about, which is that he thinks that we should not be looking at housing data nationally. We shouldn't be looking at it by metro. We should really be looking at it by neighborhood. Like, we should be looking at it by street. Like, because that's what matters to people. Which is true, but what do you do with that? I'm <laughs> like, that, that it's sort of useless to me. But, um, but what I started to think was, I thought, well, how can I get some somewhat granular data? And um, that was who I... So I went to him, and he basically was able to take this data, which he has by zip code across the country, and then sort of aggregate it. And what you'll sort of see is 
if you go to the prep, the home values in the hundred hundred and fifty thousand dollar range, you see they essentially are kind of flat. They they went down and then they have sort of not recovered and they've kind of barely gone up. And then if you go to the home values in the one million dollar range or the five hundred thousand dollars to one million dollar range, they've gone way up, especially those very high end homes. Um, and so that was sort of the first piece of data that we got, which was showing this idea, which is sort of similar a bit to what Skylar talked about, that um, the more you're, the more richer you were in the beginning, the more your home was worth, the better you've done. And then the second data that I went um, and got was through Zillow, and they eventually sort of published this. But um, and that I so then I basically I started to do that, and then the election happened, and it was clear that we needed to tie this into what was going on with Clinton and Trump, because inequality had suddenly become this big issue. Um, and so I went to Zillow and, uh, and, as, and sort of asked, could we look at um, Trump versus Clinton counties? And, um, and this is what you find. And um, I think what is actually sort of interesting about it is that, and Skylar touched on this, what you find is not necessarily that I had thought that the divide would just kind of go like this, right? And the Trump counties would keep getting worse and the Clinton counties would keep getting better. But what I actually find is that the Clinton counties were just much more volatile. They went down by way more, but they've gone up by way more. And the Trump counties are kind of flat. Um, and this data is similar if you take just the ones that flip for Clinton, the ones that flip for Trump. And so well, that was surprising to me and forced me to think about things a little bit in terms of it's not so much that things are terrible, it's that things are boring. That, um, and it kind of explains a little bit politically why people in those places feel frustrated because there's been all this national discussion, all this money, all this policy that's gone into rescuing these homeowners in places, in, in, in these big cities, and it's sort of irrelevant to a lot of these people. Their home values didn't go down by much, but they're also not really going up by anything. Um, and you'll see sort of that sort of holds true for um, negative equity as well. Trump counties are now slightly above Clinton counties, but you see Clinton counties sort of have a much bigger spike. Um, and so that's sort of the story. The story, uh, the kind of broad story is this story about the housing recovery and how it's divided America, and it's divided America between the wealthy and the poor, and it's also divided America between urban and rural areas. And it helps to explain some of the frustration about people living in these places. Um, one of the, the final challenge, so once we had all that data, what, was to get an anecdote. And I was sort of like, well, who's the anecdote? Because it's not really someone who lost their home. It's, it's not someone who's this really dramatic story. It's actually like, you know, these people ended up going to Lucerne County, Pennsylvania. It's actually these people that are just kind of sitting around and like, they're watching what's going on in the rest of the country and they're watching this great housing bust and this great housing recovery and it feels irrelevant to them. Um, and I sort of told different stories out of, um, out of Pennsylvania. One was actually about a young couple about my age who said, you know, we could have, we actually were like living in New Jersey, working in New York, and we realized we could like never afford to buy a house in a place like Hoboken, and we moved back to Pennsylvania and can buy this house with like a $2,000 down payment, and it's actually kind of great. Um, but there, were, uh, there was sort of another story about someone who was like, well, I want to move to a place of opportunity, and I can't because my home is not worth very much, and it's never going to be worth very much. And the divide between what, it now cost, what I can sell my home for in Scranton and what I can buy a home for in New York is getting bigger and bigger, or you know, just outside of New York, is getting bigger and bigger, and there's just no possibility of that. And so it's also sort of a story about economic mobility and the fact that it's kind of trapping people in rural areas and making it hard for people to move where there are jobs. Um, and so, it, yeah, it all sort of came together in a day and, um, and uh, is not a perfect story, but uh, I think was a way, I guess, because I, I guess the final thing I'll say was it was a way to try to figure out, you know, there's a lot of complaints, uh, legitimately, that the mainstream press is not covering what's going on in these Trump places enough. And part of the reason why I wasn't covering it was because I was like, how do you cover, what do you say about a flat line? Um, and so this was a way to say, well, let's contrast a flat line with like a crazy line. And that can also sort of be a, be a story. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. How did you find the right homeowners to put a face on it? Um, I, I, so usually what I do is I go to Zillow and um, I, 
find agents on Zillow who are like some of their top sellers. Through the agents. Through the agents. And then just assume those people are probably busy and know a lot of people and ask them. Um, and it's usually, you know, it's just sort of that, that easy. Yeah. Um, this was a really great story, by the way. Oh, thank you. Uh, when I first read it, I wondered how you sort of conceptualized it. Like, did, uh, did you see data that sparked an idea, or did you have a sense and then went to the data to see if you were right or not? Like, how, does that make sense? Yes, good question. I, so I think in this case, I actually had, I had an idea and the idea was wrong. Like I had an idea that you would see way more foreclosures. You'd see like you see these sort of lower income like Trump County homeowners being way worse off and like having these super high foreclosure rates. And and that was my idea and, and I went and I basically went to these two data sources that I figured would probably have been different types of data. And it just didn't really actually bear out that well, um, and so I kind of had to like think about okay, well, what's that? What's the real story? And the real story wasn't one of like it's terrible to be a Trump voter and it's wonderful to be a Clinton voter. It's more like if you're a Clinton voter, you were on this roller coaster, but you're right now you're on the top of that roller coaster, so you feel pretty good. And if you're a Trump voter, you're on like the water ride, and the water ride is like <laughs> not very exciting and kind of feels like why can't I get anywhere? Um, so this one was like this one was definitely like working backwards. Um, for sure, I'm sure you're, like, there are also stories where like the data drives the story. Um, but for this, it was more like this idea about like how do I write uh, how do I write a story about the housing crisis and the election and uh, what's the best way to do it. It's so interesting um, because it, it's almost counterintuitive in a way because the um, the charts you were showing, yeah. the Clinton voters aren't even as high as they were before. They're right. still lower. Yes. But so, so did you conclude that it's just sort of the excitement of feeling like something's happening? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. The Trump yes. voters actually are above where they were before yeah. the bus, and the Clinton voters are not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think what I sort of concluded is that people in America just like to see their home values going up, and they forget what happened 10 years ago. <laughs> And you know, and if your home values aren't going up, but you're like, you know, part of what I came away from this was like, the Trump voters aren't really doing that badly. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not good. like they're horribly underwater, but it's just like this feeling that like in America, you know, you want you expect to see your home values go up by like five percent a year, and that and that if that's not happening, you feel like something is is wrong. And I don't mean to sort of dismiss it. I mean I think the the widening of the gap is important because it does it does make it harder. It makes you less it makes you less mobile. It makes it less likely people will buy in those areas. I think some <laughs> of the reason why this is so flat is because people with lower incomes can't get mortgages. So it's like it's not to dismiss it, but yeah, it it is sort of interesting that you're actually in some sense better off if you bought on that red line. Surely your um, guy, Dice, would say, this makes no sense, show me the, the I mean, this, you're, if you consider how many counties there are and how many people vote in those counties, and you're mm -hmm. counting the counties which voted a plurality for Trump or not, you know, like, you've done a lot of aggregating there. Wouldn't he say that, you know, yeah. you have to look at each mark in each city to, and, how they voted there to kind of tell the story. I mean, I'm not taking yeah. away from this, I'm just wondering if, if yeah. that guy uh, would, would say, no, there's another story here. Yeah, so, and I think that's maybe to some degree, it is the flaw in writing about the national housing market because the only time there was really a national housing market was from 2003 to 2010, and that was a disaster. And there's, there, that's no longer the case. It's, it, it is a series of local markets down to, I mean, anyone who's ever bought a house knows that really what you care about is what's happening like within five blocks of you. Um, and I, I don't have an answer for it except that like I wouldn't be able to get up in the morning and do my job if I didn't accept that there's some value to still talking about these broad trends, um, but accepting that I think there are other people, like people in this room, who are like reporting on what's going on locally, um, which is a different story. But I mean, yeah, I, I mean, you know, some of that's why we have the zip code level data in here, which is a little bit more granular and which sort of supports it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think those are fair points. And it's just like, some of it is just like, you know, I can't. If I do a story that's just about certain Pennsylvania, no one's going to read it. So, um, so you kind of accept the the flaws of the the job. <laughs> sure. Um, 
I'm trying to figure out how, what's the um, correlation between the between their voting preference and the the home value um, because I, I'm thinking uh, yes. maybe like the Trump County or Trump supporting um, places. If you look at the back history, maybe like for the recent few decades or even a hundred mm -hmm. years or something, because they're they're the inner land and the 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 um, line will always be like this flatter than the coastal bigger cities, mm -hmm. and that did that drive so, them to vote for extremely conservative candidates yeah. before? So I'm, I'm having a hard time getting this to work, but one of the things that supports the idea that there is at least some correlation. I mean, again. It's kind of like this, like this is not an academic paper, so it's like, you know, whether or not it's a full correlation or anything like that, I wouldn't even begin to suggest. But there, there is a graph that looks at specifically the counties that flipped, and the divide is even more stark. So it suggests that the counties that flipped for Trump it was even more sort of, and versus the Clinton that flipped for Clinton, the divide between the two is is even is even larger, which sort of suggests that that kind of that kind of frustration about how flat home prices were in those Trump counties versus how dramatically they've gone up in the counties that flipped for Clinton, maybe that's sort of feeding into the rage. And then some of that is just like good old fashioned reporting, right? Some of that was just like calling a bunch of people in Pennsylvania and trying to not ask leading questions, like trying not to say like, hey, did you vote for Trump because your home isn't worth very much? It was like trying to like <laughs> call and be like, hey, you know, how do you feel about your home? And people would say, you know, it sucks. And then, you know, there's the quote in the, in the story from the guy that's like, you know, they were so busy dealing with this foreclosure crisis, they forgot about us. Um, and so it's just like allowing people to speak for themselves, um, which is, you know, just sort of journalism. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, sort of a similar question, just like, we, we also hear, right, that the Trump uh, voters were of a, uh, were, were high, were, were altogether like high income, right? But their, but the county's home values are less. Mm -hmm. So sort of how does, how do you, how do you square that? Like, is it, is it that there are like high income people with low home values or? Are we talking about just like a medium? Well, so these thing? are these are counties that went for Trump. So I, I guess I would say my guess. So I, I don't. I actually didn't know that that, that uh, Trump voters were high income. So I, my guess would be that you obviously had some super high income people. It, you definitely have rich people voting for Trump because they thought it would bring down their taxes and that kind of thing. But those people still might have been in New York or you know or wherever, um, and so wouldn't necessarily have been in a county that went for, for Trump. Um, and some of it, I don't, yeah, I don't know, some of it could be that they're high income, but these are still, I mean, these are still sort of Midwestern counties with low home values. Yeah, I don't actually, it wasn't, that wasn't the thing I looked into, but. Yeah, no worries, I should check my data as well. <laughs> How do you, you're a national housing reporter, right? So yeah. So like, and it's such a local beat. Yes. You know, I cover it in Boston, it's intensely local here, right? How do you look for stories that resonate with a national audience, but also have like, like the nuance that comes with local, the localness of covering housing? Yeah, so I think more often than not, it's definitely like starting with a theme and then working back to the local example as opposed to the other way around. Right. So like I just did a story about Measure S in Los Angeles, which was just like development moratorium. And that was like coming from this idea that I wanted to tell a story about big cities and the pushback of big cities and development. And then it was like, how can I find the most like dramatic, crazy local example? And some of it is that the nuance gets like a little bit lost. Like the LA Times clearly did like a way better job of covering it than I did. Um, but I had to sort of, I did one story on it, and you know, and you kind of try to like write it in a way that people will be interested. I find home prices is like especially problematic because um, it's just like what's going on in Denver right now is completely different from what's going on in like even the New York metro area, which is basically flat. Um, and some of that is just like writing, like kind of just like acknowledging the flaws in the story right out, like just basically saying like. Home prices went up, uh, you know, X percent this month. You know, so there might be a five, about five, five to six percent. But within that, there's all these variations, and that that sh actually shows that the market is pretty healthy. But yeah, I mean, that's like the big, I don't know. It's the it's the big challenge. Um, 
is trying to be intellectually honest and still write about trend, these huge trends. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So my name is uh, Kristen Capps. I'm a staff writer at City Lab, which is uh, the urbanism website for the Atlantic. Uh, City Lab started, kicked off in, in 2011 as the Atlantic Cities at a time when the Atlantic had this strategy of making channels that were called the Atlantic X, the Atlantic Y. We never got around to launching the Atlantic Sports, which was the one that I really wanted to write for, but instead I do <laughs> housing. Um, we re it was renamed uh, City Lab in 2013 for some kind of synergy purposes with a national event. That's when um, I started writing for City Lab. Um, and today, I just kind of picked out a few stories that I'm going to gloss really superficially. Uh, some that worked, or one that worked, I think, one that definitely didn't, and um, one that I'm, I'm still kind of not sure about. OK, so this is one from, uh, from 2015. And one of the challenges that we have at City Lab is that all of our stories have to be national, but all of our stories are you know, also kind of local. I think that everyone in this room is sort of familiar with this dilemma about taking a subject matter that is not especially national and turning it into national news. Um, well, we're taking stories that are, that are definitely not national and trying to find a kind of national uh, uh, appeal in them. So we can cover local markets, we can dive in really closely on uh, some market um, and do a story, but the hook has to be something that people who, living might, who might be living outside of New York or Los Angeles or Dallas or whatever would be you know, potentially interested in reading. Um, so this story did, I mean, decently, I suppose, like pickup wise, and it's about um, tax, property tax assessment in New York and the kind of level of condos that are being built um, south, immediately south of the park, and kind of explained um, why uh, the, the kind of complex like state law for assessing property taxes and how it's built on like a comparison. Uh, they assess property taxes by finding a like apartment or like condo, and then build the assessment based on that. But um, something like you know 157, uh, these kind of super tall, super skinny. Billionaire row, billionaires row, um, condo towers don't really have a like comparison. So it's this really inefficient um, system for, for coming up with the taxes. And uh, we were able to pull some charts that kind of show uh, those uh, disparities between the um, sales value and then the assessed uh, value. Um, so this is like a really chewy subject. I think this story is something like 5,000 words, which is uh, something that we are able to do on like, you know, two or three of those a year when you really want to kind of go into like a cover lake thing. Um, and uh, it, 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 it seemed to, to, to perform um, OK. I don't really know why I can't. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, but we tried to kind of like sex it up with some like, whoops. Um, I don't know. We tried to like put some graphics together to kind of like help tell this story. So um, you can see there's like two classes of property tax assessment. Um, we have their like our little like 157 graphic, um, but I can't show you because there's an ad. Uh, what the rest of that looks like? Well, maybe I can. Yeah, so there it shows you that, like, you know, for uh, for condo buildings, you compare it with like a like-minded uh, a, a apartment building, but that that doesn't exactly exist for um, this tower. Okay, so that one did that one did okay, fine. This is a much more recent story. It's from January. It's one I, I spent a bit of, of time working on. It's uh, kind of a longer explainer on EB five, which is a pretty fascinating topic in a lot of different markets. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with this and, and at much, much greater uh, granularity in all of your communities um, than, than I am. But uh, I think that I really failed to come up with a, 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 an angle or a, or a package or it just wasn't my day uh, to, to, to 
to convince um, a lot of our readers that this is like a really important um, story. But you know, so uh, this was uh, largely built on um, FOIA work. Um, FOIA, FOIA requests uh, through a, a number of different um, agencies that determine the um, the T zones for uh, for for EB five and um, some different data we were able to put together. Um, uh, and we, I was able to uh, build some maps that kind of show the gerrymandering that helps determine uh, how these EB-5 cash for development visas um, are distributed. I probably, I might, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the EB-5, but it is a, it is a, a program that allows you to kind of pay in, an investment into um, oh, real estate and receive a visa. Uh, and um, these have been, these were designed initially to uh, be for like rural or urban distressed communities. They've largely been concentrated in uh, increasingly luxury development. So this was kind of an explanation of why this has happened, why it's sort of outrageous, and like whether this is a program that can be reformed uh, or should uh, be reformed. And that is a debate that's still happening um, in Congress right now. So you can see these large gerrymanders. Um, this is a, a, a oh, it's damn bad. Um, uh, you can see here, uh, this is one park lane. It's a luxury hotel, um, or was going to be a luxury hotel. It's now not, I don't think, uh, south of the park. And in order to fulfill its requirement to have a certain level of unemployment um, to qualify for, for the, a specific tranche of EB-5 investment, um, they create these, uh, these, these zones of unemployment. And this one um, kind of like warps through Central Park uh, to connect to George Washington Carver public houses, which have a really high unemployment to say that this one park lane is uh, going to benefit uh, um, all these jobs. Uh, um, and it, it gets a, a, lot, a lot crazier here. So you can kind of see, this is Hudson Yards, the biggest real estate um, project in what history? I don't know, uh, but like a really, really big one. And so, you know, they wanted to apply for, they have two rounds of $600 million in EB-5 investment, create something like 1,400 visas for families. Um, but in order to, to qualify for, for this level of foreign direct investment, they had to say that they're an, uh, an urban distressed district. And to do that, they, they draw this gerrymandered map, which you, you can't see how, wait, 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 I can do that, right? Oh yeah, okay. So you see they, they draw the same map, it takes the same Central Park warp zone, and um, it connects to all of these different public um, housing, uh, centers so that the unemployment reached, I think, what was like 9.3 percent. They're kind of saying that Hudson Yards is a 9.3 percent unemployment area and therefore should have 1.2 billion dollars uh, for an investment that is meant for rural or urban districts. Um, this is kind of, it, it's, a, it's a really outrageous thing and um, I'm sure that people here have, have, have examples from, from all over. Uh, um, but I also wanted to tell like a second part of the story, which is that there are places where it's happening in rural communities. There are places where it is actually happening in urban um, distressed area. The, the, the kinds of developments that were, um, were designed to benefit from this program. So I talked to some people in um, Kansas City about this um, kind of like food university program they're starting. It's uh, Northwest Missouri State University's agriculture department is moving into Kansas City and like building up this food hub and uh, it's in a sort of food desert and it's just one census tract that qualified it for like a fairly modest level of EB-5 development. Well that seems like a good story, a lot better than um, you know a casino luxury hotel in Las Vegas like um, shoveling up something like I mean just hundreds of hundreds of uh, millions of dollars in this kind of development. Um, 
And then talk to, I'm just scrolling down to the pictures. Uh, I'll get back to that one. What percentage of the EB5 visa <coughs> holders were Chinese? Is it, do you know? 90. 90. It, it, I think it's 90%. Yeah. Um, and I believe it's somewhere around 90% go to um, luxury developments, 90% of the EB5 development cash. So like a really, really heavily tilted program. Um, this is a, a really cool project in, um, like in rural Vermont, a resort with like a wa indoor water slide, and there was going to be like a bio campus or whatever, and it was just like a complete and total scam. Um, a lot of the EB-5 development has been t tied up with fraud, even potential national security lapses. Um, this is a, it's a problematic program, but I did speak with um, some people in North Dakota. I didn't get to go there, but um, I'm gonna try to find it here. Uh, this facility, uh, the one that this arrow is pointing to, called Ultra Green, it makes like those Chipotle baskets uh, that are like out of like wheat straw, uh, waste, uh, whatever, um, and created like 200 jobs in um, rural North, North Dakota. So, so there is, I'm trying to make a case um, that this is like a really problematic program, but actually could be um, ranked in, and it's still... Uh, a debate. Uh, there was a hearing on it, uh, hearing uh, uh, on the Hill about it the other day, and I was like really, really like shocked um, because every expert they brought, like almost every expert, was like, totally inappropriate. There was someone from the Center for Immigration Studies, which is like founded by white nationalists, like just like horrifying. But they are debating it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, this was like 6,000 words, a little bit of travel, a lot of phone calls, a lot of research, um, reading and consulting with people at NYU who study this subject really closely. It sank like a lead weight to the bottom of a swimming pool. Um, and I'm still trying, it's like my pinned tweet, I'm still trying to get people to read this goddamn story. <laughs> they won't. Uh, why though? Why? why? It's a great story. Because I guess I don't get to go to all of my readers and give like a 15 minute. <laughs> <laughs> we just like put it in newsletters and Facebook and stuff. How did you find that story? Or how did you come up with it? Uh, a lot of reporters have re reported on it. I mean, EB5 has been a subject of uh, a great deal of really good reporting um, <coughs> from Las Vegas to uh, the Journal, especially good on it. Uh, the Times, uh, I certainly didn't discover it. Uh, I just wanted to um, see if there was kind of like a national appetite for conversation about this subject, and also to focus at, at, at a, um, the rural and urban distress level, because like the Kansas City Star stories on EB-5 are like not as well read as the Wall Street Journal stories on it, but the Kansas City Stars are like stories of like really good things happening, whereas the Wall Street Journal stories are about like another billionaire condo built by Jared Kushner or whatever, you know, yeah. or uh, with lots of Chinese investment. Um, so squaring of that is something that we um, try to do at City Lab is, is, is putting together those threads from, um, from, from different places. Uh, so this is a story about like a really, really NIMBY bill by this um, Texas representative. Uh, Valerie Swanson out of Spring, Texas, which is, or a district covering most of Spring, Texas, which is, you know, suburban Houston, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's great stuff. I mean, it essentially, uh, we take the distribution of LIHTC housing credits, and um, uh, which are, which, which have, you know, you have the application for LIHTC housing credits, and they go before uh, a number of individuals who, who will approve them. This would expand that number to include representatives from like every neighborhood association within a five mile radius of a, of a light tech development. And when I saw this um, bill come up in text at, at Texas Ledge, uh, I was already following her because she is like, she, she, <laughs> because she's a character and is like, uh, like uh, put, put out like a bill or something that said that if you've ever uh, performed an abortion, then you will lose your medical license if you just step into Texas. Um, like, like crazy bills or colorful legislation, <laughs> colorful legislation like that. Uh, so when I saw this, this bill come up in the ledge, I was like really, 
really astonished and tried to think like, well, I can put like a big screaming headline like that on it, but I really wanted to show like what it means to fall within a five mile radius of, um, of, uh, of an affordable housing project and like how many different uh, neighborhood associations would actually be in that group. I wanted to discover it for myself. I didn't know if that would be, you know, two or 10 or whatever. So um, I was able to put together uh, a, this map uh, using uh, Cardo. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, and pushed myself a little bit on this. Uh, I've been trying to learn um, to code and wrote this really crappy program in MySQL uh, that just creates a five mile radius bubble from a point I kind of picked at random in spring. So let me show you a little bit closer what this is. Uh, this is the district represented by uh, Valerie Swanson. Um, this is Houston. This is roughly spring. Um, I uh, was able to find like mapping data sets for uh, both, I mean you really have to kind of like build these from scratch with layers. So I found a layer, our shape set for uh, Texas districts. <coughs> I found um, shape sets for select um, neighborhood associations that actually create them, that like will define it and put it out in a map format. So these aren't like every neighborhood association, but you just kind of get a sense of like kind of how they look and kind of how big they are. And then I just picked a park right in the middle of spring. And, and so the question is like, how many people would then have a say in whether you can develop an affordable housing project you know, near this very central park. And it turns out to be like a lot of people would be able to um, say no. So this is like not very impressive to create a like, <laughs> like a bubble with five mile radius, which would be forever. <laughs> so uh, I'll be proud of that if no one else is. Um, finally, I wanted to uh, just kind of brag about City Lab Latino. Uh, which is a new partnership that City Lab has with uh, Univision. Uh, they came to us, and they didn't come to the Atlantic, they came specifically to City Lab. And they said, we think that there is a big appetite among Spanish-speaking audiences for this kind of national content, mostly within North America, specifically within the US, but also to some extent in um, Mexico and in Central America. They thought we could really kind of serve this audience. So uh, this is a story I did, uh, what is this? My Spanish is real bad. Uh, on uh, Donald Trump's proposed border wall, we were able to get uh, a list of companies that are interested in bidding on this wall. And wrote, uh, I wrote like two or three stories. The editor of City Lab Latino um, kind of chopped it all up and put it together in one larger story for his audience. And it's the best story. So I kind of want him to translate it back into English, so I have a, <laughs> have a copy of it. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess um, I can talk a little bit about our future and what we think are our, our problems and what we think are good solutions. Um, we've been like really itching to get a, a podcast off the ground, but like housing doesn't really lend itself for um, uh, reasons that other speakers have like described today, like it doesn't lend itself to like a national like this week in housing. There were some sales here and not as many here. Yeah, um, so we're trying to see if we can maybe make a, a tool or product out of it that will be more like extended stories. So we go into it with like a three chapter arc or a six chapter uh, arc and just uh, like do that and see if anyone will listen to it. Um, uh, but it, it, it is kind of tough, you know, like we, we imagine that the, the audience for like a really good or a good story about Boulder zoning and like the KKK's fascinating history and like crafting the zoning rule in Boulder, Colorado is like very small. Um, it doesn't get bigger because it's, well, I don't know, that's our bet. We, we were just trying to see if like you can get someone who lives in New York or Los Angeles to listen to that kind of story. I don't really know. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's probably what I would say, uh, about, um, City Lab. Uh, 
Does anybody have any questions? Kristen, who's your, who's your audience? Do you know who your readership is? Yeah. I love your site, but like, who uh, who's our audience? Yeah. Um, college educated, uh, uh, older millennials, young baby boomers. Um, I, I, I don't know, I don't really have the, the greatest grasp on that um, off the top of my head. Um, but uh, okay. a lot of people within like transit and urbanism and housing read really closely. Those are like people who will read several several times a day. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's our, our core audience, I think, is a kind of professional urbanism set. How much time do you get for your stories? How much time? Yeah. Uh, that is a really good question that my editor is kind of always asking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Too much. For <laughs> we don't have a hard hard quotas. We have had discussions about quotas that suggest to me that our sweet spot is between um, five and ten stories a week. Oh, wow. Not you personally. You per me personally. Not you yeah. personally. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yes. Um, first off, I read the EB five story. I didn't realize that you wrote it when I met you, but I read that story and I thought it was awesome. And the maps were. Great. Thank you. So you I now know one, one of the like yeah, seven one people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I appreciate How long did it take you to put that EB5 story together? Uh, I wouldn't be able to say. I, I think I wrote it over a two month period. I definitely did not spend two months on it. Got it. And I think that you kind of identified um, a problem that, that I encounter writing about issues of affordability and stuff in Charlotte, um, uh -huh. which is the audience and our core subscriber um, doesn't really look like the people who are impacted most by affordability issues. Mm -hmm. Our core subscriber, the you know, dwindling share of people who pay for our product and keep us afloat tend to be uh, older, highly educated, white, affluent. And we've started very aggressively tracking online engagement and eliminating and restructuring entire beats and jobs based on how many click stuff gets and housing affordability stuff <clears throat> policy wonky stuff the stuff that I really enjoy as zoning you know land use stuff doesn't do that well so you know maybe this isn't a question just for you specifically but in general in the room how do you think about connecting with audiences that don't look in a lot of cases like the people who are, you know, really being affected by this. Um, sort of or me specifically, yeah. Uh, you, whoever. Uh, yeah. So you know, actually, I did. I did mean to talk about that, and so I'm really glad you asked this question. Um, so we're part of the Atlantic, um, and 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 really closely tied to it. I mean, Quartz is also owned by the Atlantic Media Company, but it's very, very, very separate deal. We're we're um, you know first cousins with uh, the Atlantic.com. But we are, we are um, building out our own business unit. So this has suddenly been like this boring, pressing question at every meeting is like discussing um, audience and um, kind of traffic and who our core readers are because we're, we now have like a three person business um, and marketing unit specifically connected to City Lab. And um, that is something like, something between a productive conversation and a fight is about how to keep our like um, focus on justice when our readers are overwhelmingly, um, or to keep our focus on justice when our when our readers are overwhelmingly, um, you know, white men around my age who want to argue about bike lanes. Um, <laughs> I do too. I'm one of them. It's a problem. Um, and I don't know how to totally square that circle. Um, certainly, uh, we, we, we have some, we have uh, the, one of the things that we will un unveil in like our new um, redesign when it comes out will be like a little bit better channel system. One of them is justice. We're going to really commit to it, but people don't right now come to us necessarily for that topic. And growing that share of readership, we think, is a responsibility, but it's a hard one that is not yet, um, I don't know, driving the clicks. Yeah, it's tough because if the incentive is to drive clicks, 
you know, I could write about protected bike lanes in downtown Charlotte and, you know, the zoning fight over a new brewery. I could do that three times a day and people would just keep clicking it. And the stuff, you know, a lot of the meat around the issues that we've been talking about here has, uh, you know, I mean, it's probably partially my fault too. I'm not saying like, oh, I'm doing amazing work and poor me, but it is really tough to connect that to our identified core audience. Yeah, um, I, also I think that there hasn't been a, a lot of experimentation in this realm. There's like a lot more fretting and less like failed efforts. Uh, I mean, code switch at NPR is like a very successful property. Um, I honestly don't know how well City Lab Latino is doing or not. I know that they want to maybe expand it by another reporter. So it seems to be something they're they're still um, investing in. But um, there are not enough uh, experiments in this realm to like say what the what the audience really is like or what it would be after some some better investment and um, commitment. Mm -hmm. well, the other thing too that I point out is that the, the corollary to your excellent point is with all the analytics we have now, we can ask the other question, which is, do the important stories that we write about housing affordability actually make it to the people who need that news? No matter how often we write them, if, you know, we were talking about this earlier, and I, I was thinking about some of the health stories that we do. When we write about lead poisoning in children who are really at a crisis point, that doesn't get clicked too much. Where it gets clicked is if we find an upper middle class child whose parents are pediatricians and they've, their lovingly restored Victorian has lead in the ancient stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. That goes crazy. Well, look at crime too. Exactly. Victims of crime. But, but you know, how do we reach people whose children really are at crisis for lead. And, and so we've been trying to think about, can we use social media? Can we use other forms of outreach to try to get our news to other audiences? It's Maybe a, it's a real issue. More partnerships with like papers like mine. It's a good point. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Community right. papers. And mm -hmm. we are heavily understaffed. So to have a partnership with a larger yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I want to chime in this as well because uh, I work for a community newspaper as well. I think there's really the need that the mainstream media and community media to tie together mm -hmm. and to do story together because we really know the communities and you guys have a very much stronger editorial um, resources mm -hmm. so that if we work together we will both have much better stories. Um, but I think the only problem is now people have to change their mindset. Mm -hmm. um, it, it never happened before. Um, and, and first of all, community newspapers are not really considered as part of the, the whole journalism industry yet. Um, and also, um, the mainstream media always think we can do everything. You know, we are powerful enough. We don't need you guys. I think things really need to change. Um, work together. It, I, I think should be the theme of, of the future of this industry. Great point. I also think you're seeing a lot of that in um, mainstream media and sort of online mm -hmm. partnerships like ProPublica, the Marshall Project, mm -hmm. partnering with like the New York Times or CNN mm -hmm. to get content out because those places are doing high level niche content, yeah. which is also great stuff, but unless you're a you know, criminal justice scholar, you're probably not going to the Marshall Project mm -hmm. site you know, every day. So it's like gather, using the publishing power that mainstream, mainstream media <coughs> has and connecting it with these, because also you don't have this many specialists in mainstream who are doing that type of work. So I'm seeing a lot of that <coughs> partner, partnering as well. Yeah, well I was gonna add that it seems like, it makes me think of what Sean Donovan said last night about how do you write about uh, the people who aren't in the room. Um, how do you write about exclusion? Like, who is your main character if your story is about an all-white suburb that has no multifamily housing in it? Um, like, you can write about the efforts to keep people out and the political machinations, but like, I don't know, it's, it's definitely harder to get people interested in policy stories and zoning stories unless there are like lives at the center of them, so. Yeah, yeah sometimes I think it takes some soul searching about an honesty 
about who your audience actually is and what they're willing to receive. Mm -hmm. One of the shifts that I've tried to do in my coverage of public housing is frame it in the sense that these are tax dollars that you are paying for people to have housing that they're not getting. Mm -hmm. And so framing it for our readers, I'm at the Chicago Tribune, in a sense that this is, this is something you're paying for that should be offered gets them more engaged, then you should feel empathetic toward this family who's not being housed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Great point. I think about that resonates with that, every audience, too. <laughs> to, to I think that idea also that like, you're going to be paying for this. Your tax dollars are going to pay for something. Mm -hmm. So they're either going to pay for this person to be in jail, or they're going to pay for this person to have an efficient apartment, or they're going to pay for the person to be sitting in an ER. Like that, It's going to be paid for. So this idea of, like, like when I think about what we learned or like what we were talking about all day, it's like this money is going to be spent. So when we start cutting things, like no matter what you do, like you're, either your taxes are going to go up or something's going to happen, um, to me makes sense and, and, and gets at that idea. Because I'm at the New York Times and I'm still thinking the same thing. Um, and even though there's some partnerships like ProPublica, I, my first job ever was at an African American Weekly, and I don't really think of any partnerships where we're seeing black newspapers or um, I speak like I speak I'm Haitian so I also say like Haitian newspapers or Chinese language newspapers. I don't really see anybody talking in my newsroom at all in other newsrooms about like we should partner up with like this, like oh immigration's a big deal, like let's see if we can partner up with like Spanish language newspapers along the border. Like that's that's not really happening. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any more questions I can ask? <laughs> Still standing. Thank you.